We are in Senior English B, and uh, we are now continuing with our conversation regarding Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. You want to be on page 821. You want to have out your annotations now. You want to have listed parts 1 through 7. Suggestion. Skip several lines between each number. Okay. By the way, if you haven't done this at all, you can be working now on your annotations. If you've already done these annotative readings, you're working on the right-hand side with a obviously different color ink uh, uh, as opposed to a pre-class notes. All right. And here we go. We are now going to listen to a professional reader read for us this entire poem. All you're doing is reading along as you get to the end of each part. Jot down at least one thing that you wish to remember from this uh, part, okay? So that by the time we finish, we're ready then to begin to talk about at level 2A, what are the major themes or messages of a text like this, all right? So here we go, you're on 821, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, let's stay focused all the way through. Just enjoy the reading and the storytelling, of course, that comes with it as well. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Argument. How a ship, having passed the line, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole. And how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. Part one. An ancient mariner meeteth three gallants bidden to a wedding feast, and detaineth one. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long grey beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayest hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand, there was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, great beard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop, below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather till it reached the line. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the mariner continueth his tale. The bride hath paced into the hall. Red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship, driven by a storm, toward the south pole. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings, and chased us south along, with sloping masts and dipping prow, as who, pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. And ice mast high came floating by, as green as emerald. The land of ice and of fearful sounds, where no living thing was to be seen. And through the drifts the snowy clifts did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. 
The ice was here, the ice was there. The ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. Till a great seabird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality. At length did cross an albatross. Thorough the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And lo, the albatross proveth a bird of good omen, and followeth the ship as it returned northward through fog and floating ice. And a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud or mast or shroud, it perched from Vespers nine, whilst all the night, through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. The ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look'st thou so with my crossbow? I shot the albatross. <coughs> Part two. The sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's home. His shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe. For all a bird, I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. But when the thought cleared off, they justify the same, and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. Nor dim nor red, like God's own head, the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred, I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze continues. The ship enters the Pacific Ocean and sails northward even till it reaches the line. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. The ship have been suddenly becalmed. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. It was sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. And the albatross begins to be avenged. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burned green and blue. A spirit had followed them, one of the invisible inhabitants of this planet, neither departed souls nor angels. They are very numerous, and there is no climate or element without one or more. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us, from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. The shipmates, in their sore distress, 
would fain throw the whole guilt on the ancient mariner, inside whereof they hang the dead seabird round his neck. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Part three. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched and glazed, each eye. A weary time, a weary time. How glazed each weary eye. When looking westward, I beheld a something in the sky. The ancient mariner beholdeth a sign in the element afar off. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved, and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist, and still it neared and neared. As if it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and tacked and veered. At its nearer approach, it seemeth him to be a ship, and at a dear ransom he freeth his speech from the bonds of thirst. <coughs> with throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could not laugh nor wail. Through utter drought all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, A sail! A sail! A flash of joy. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, agape they heard me call. Gramercy for joy did grin. And all at once their breath drew in, as they were drinking all. And horror follows, for can it be a ship that comes onward without wind or tide? Right. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more. Hither to work us wheel without a breeze, without a tide. She steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. When that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. It seemeth him but the skeleton of a ship. And straight the sun was flecked with bars. Heaven's mother sent us grace, as if through a dungeon great he peered with broad and burning face. And its ribs are seen as bars on the face of the setting sun. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? The spectre woman and her death mate, and no other on board the skeleton ship. Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Like vessel, like crew. Her lips were red, her looks were funny, her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was as white as leprosy. A nightmare life in death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. Death and life in death have diced for the ship's crew, and she, the latter, winneth the ancient mariner. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. No twilight within <coughs> the courts of the sun. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out, at once dried comes the dark. With far heard whisper o'er the sea, off shot the spectre bark. At the rising of the moon, we listened and looked sideways up, fear at my heart, as at a cup, my life 
blood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night. The steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white. From the sails the dew did drip. Till clomb above the eastern bar, the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip. One after another. One after one by the star-dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly bang and cursed me with his eye. His shipmates dropped down, dead. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. They all die. But life in death begins her work on the ancient man. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe. And every soul it passed me by, like the whiz of my crossbow. Part four. The wedding guest feareth that a spirit is talking to him. I fear thee, ancient mariner. I fear thy skinny hand. And thou art long and lank and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. <coughs> I fear thee and thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest. This body drop not down. But the ancient mariner assureth him of his bodily life, and proceedeth to relate his horrible penance. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. Famous lines. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. He despiseth the creatures of the calm. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie. And a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. And envieth that they should live, and so many lie dead. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven, and tried to pray. But or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them closed. And the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. But the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead men. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. In his loneliness and fixedness, he yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn, yet still move onward. And everywhere the blue sky belongs to them and is their appointed rest and their native country and their own natural homes, which they enter unannounced, as lords that are suddenly expected, and yet there is a silent joy at their arrival. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like April hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burned all way, a still and awful red. By the 
light of the moon, he beholdeth God's creatures of the great calm. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. An important moment in the poem, watch. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire. Blue, glossy, green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Their beauty and their happiness. He blesseth them in his heart. Oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The spirit begins to break. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. A really important moment. Part five. Oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Mary Queen the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. By grace of the Holy Mother, the ancient mariner is refreshed with rain. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamed that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all but dank. Sure, I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved and could not feel my limbs, I was so light. Almost I thought that I had died in sleep, and was a blessed ghost. He heareth sounds, and seeth strange sights, and commotions in the sky, and the elements. <coughs> and soon I heard a roaring wind. It did not come near, but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. All right, here we go. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro they were hurried about, and to and fro, and in and out, the wan stars danced between. And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge, and the rain poured down from one black cloud, the moon was at its edge. The thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side, like waters shot from some high crag. The lightning fell with never a jag, the river steep and wide. The bodies of the ship's crew were inspired, and the ship moves on. The loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake, nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all gan work the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said naught to me. But not by the souls of the men, nor by demons of earth or middle air, but by a blessed troop of angelic spirits sent down by the invocation of the guardian saint. I fear thee, ancient mariner, right. be calm. Thou wedding guest, t'was not those souls that fled in pain, which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. 
for when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes, a dropping from the sky, I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all the little birds that are, how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now, it was like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel's song that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased, yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Till noon we quietly sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, Move from beneath. The lonesome spirit from the South Pole carries on the ship as far as the line in obedience to the angelic truth, but still requireth vengeance. Under the keel nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun, right up above the mast, had fixed her to the ocean. But in a minute, she began stir, with a short, uneasy motion. Backwards and forwards, half her length, with a short, uneasy motion. Ladies, then, anyone the pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell down in a swoon. The polar spirits, fellow demons, the invisible inhabitants of the element, take part in his wrong. And two of them relate, one to the other, that penance long and heavy for the ancient mariner hath been accorded to the polar spirit, who returneth southward. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air. Is it he, quoth one, is this the man? By him who died on cross, with his cruel bow he laid full low, the harmless albatross. The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow. He loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honeydew. Quoth he, the man hath penance done, and penance more will do. Part six. Okay, we're gonna stop there for uh, now. I'd like to look at that last line you just read. We're gonna come back to it. The man has penance more to do. What does the word penance mean? Do you know that word? What is that? A it's a religious word. Do you know what it means? Penance is what? Something you pay for because why? You did something wrong, right? Something you pay for, you did something wrong. Now, can you already kind of start to guess what is the penance? That this old man is going to have to pay again and again and again. What is the penance that he's going to have to pay? What is it that he did wrong? He killed an innocent bird. What is it that he's going to have to do, though, for the rest of his life? What's the penance that he's going to have to pay again and again and again? Have you figured this out yet? It is. It's the telling of this story. The telling, you want to put that in your notes. The telling of this story is his penance. He has to tell this story over 
and over and over. But, key for your notes, doesn't tell the story to everyone. Only tells the story to very selected people. We're going to end tomorrow, and we're going to ask, who does he choose to tell the story to, and why? And what's supposed to be learned from a whacked out story like this, about a guy who kills an albatross, and 200 men die in the doldrums of starvation. They can't drink anything anymore. All their water's gone, right? And then they die, but he doesn't die. And he has what hung around his neck? What do they hang around his neck? The dead bird, the albatross, gets hung around his neck. We're going to ask about things like, what's the metaphoric meaning of the albatross around your neck. It becomes a very famous phrase in English language. We often will say this, oh, you've got the albatross around your neck. What does that mean? See, we'll start talking as well about that. And then ultimately, they all come back to life again so that they can all move the ship and sail it back towards home. When we come back tomorrow, we'll see what happens when he gets uh, back towards home. Thank you.